Welcome to the Ag Inspo Podcast, where we delve into the dynamic world of agriculture, uncovering the stories that inspire, empower, and drive change. Join hosts Rena Striegel and Ron Rabo as they explore the journeys of farmers, entrepreneurs, and leaders who are making a difference as they navigate the critical work of transitioning their operation to the next generation. From navigating family dynamics to developing the next generation of ag leaders, we'll bring you the insights and inspiration you need to thrive in today's ever-evolving agricultural landscape. So whether you're a seasoned industry veteran or just starting out, get ready to be inspired, informed, and empowered as we learn from best practices and a few colossal failures on the Ag Inspo Podcast. All right, welcome to Ag Inspo, and I am super excited about the conversation that we're going to have today. Uh, Rena and I have a uh, complete uh, human inspiration that has joined the show today. We've got Sam Beveridge that's joined us. Sam is a Nebraska native, uh, ranch kid, um, and is in big agriculture, but man, does he ever have an amazing story. And so, uh, Sam, welcome to the show, and Thank um, and thanks for just being willing to know you're super busy, but thanks for being willing to take time out of your schedule to visit with us today and share some of your insights. Yeah, and, thank you. And so, uh, so kind of where I wanted to start with this is, um, uh, Sam, you you grew up in Nebraska, like I said, on a on a mm -hmm. on a sixth generation family farm and ranch. And so share a little bit about your background with us and, you know, kind of how your business was structured, you know, how, who's been involved in the business, where things are at right now. And uh, let's just, let's just roll with that and, and figure a little bit about um, Sam Beveridge and, and um, um, what he's all about from an agricultural pr perspective. You bet. Thank you guys for uh, having me today um just let's just jump right into it and, and get things going but um yeah I grew up uh, about 25 miles west of North Platte Nebraska in a little town called Sutherland Nebraska um we are the um, beverage family um as Ron mentioned we are six generations or up to right around 110 years of of owning the actual home place and, and through the years, obviously having some expansions, um, taking over some of the neighbor's properties, et cetera. But as we've kind of rolled through those years, um, I grew up, uh, you know, came out of the womb wearing boots. I think I broke my first collarbone at, at 12 months old, falling off of a horse and, uh, when my dad was trying to take my picture. And, and so as we kind of came up through the ranks of, of growing up in agriculture, that was what you knew. That was your lifestyle. It was every Saturday, every Sunday, working cattle or going out and checking the pivots. Um, and as it progressed, I moved up into uh, management positions where I started to um, mow some of the prairie grass. I started out at a high whopping salary of a penny a minute. Um, I quickly learned the, the value of business and a penny a minute is not something that you're going to get rich on. And so I had to renegotiate with what I will call the board of directors, my grandfather, on how much I was going to get paid on a daily basis because that first check of $3.60 just wasn't going to do it even even at the ice cream shop in town so you know you start to learn those valuable lessons and those little things right then and there and it just kind of starts to build from there um i you know my father was very close with my grandfather my dad while we ran the ranch he he was a um, teacher for 34 years so um, in cooperation, cooperation with working on the farm, we had a couple hired men. Uh, my dad then taught high school welding and metals um, at the local high school for 34 years prior to retiring uh, once my grandfather passed away. Um, 
as far as my dad's labor, it was my brother and I. So I have a younger brother, Tom, um, that's a couple years younger than me that is currently running most of the operations there today um, in cooperation with a couple of our hired men just to handle the workload and the, and the diversification. Within our ranch and farm, I would call it, um, we manage around uh, 400 to 500 head of cow-calf pair. And so we're running, you know, from the breeding seasons to calving season each and every year. Um, we traditionally move those cattle um, right at fall, right off of the right off of the cow through most of the local video auctions that have now come on. But, you know, I can still remember the days that we would sit in the sale barn all day. And that was that was the best thing. And I, my job was to write down how much we got per pound and figure out what, what the size of that check was going to be as a little kid. And so my interest in agriculture became in that space. Um, on, the, on the farming side, we manage um, right around a couple thousand acres to 3,000 acres, um, most of that being irrigated um, land. But we also have a, a vast majority that's very dry land. Being out in the sand hills of Nebraska, we have um, kind of the the two ends of the spectrum. One, we're right on top of the Ogallala Aquifer for for pivots and irrigation, so those areas are are naturally um, conducive to you know your row crops such as corn and soy. And then we have a lot of grassland that's just in the really sandy soils and in the dry land that's such, and so it becomes winter wheats and and a lot of um, prairie grass for the cattle that we background on. Through the years, um, we've continued to manage this um, operation. We've managed it very um, conservatively, I would say. Um, I think in times that we could expand, we've chose not to. We've, we've been those types of farmers that did not always own the newest equipment, but we were very good at fixing equipment. I think my dad's background in, in being a, a shop teacher and welding and metals, um, I became, you know, very good at reading owner's manuals, understanding where the grease zerks were in each and every tractor and each and every implement, because in order for those pieces of equipment to have longevity, you had to keep the bearings greased, you had to do the maintenance, and you had to do the uptake in the off season in order to keep things going. Because as everyone knows today, the costs continue to rise. The price of a combine, the price of a tractor are those that are almost unreachable for most of us in smaller agricultural today. And, um, and so we just, we really, we learned that, um, that work ethic and that conservativeness coming out of, out of our farming operation. And we still manage it to what we can today. Um, I think as we face more and more of the challenges of, of tomorrow, we're seeing some of our, of our um, work efforts being outsourced, one being the challenge that we've seen on the labor side of things, but also just the outright capital intensiveness to manage having equipment at these price levels and the return on those investments is really hard to um, capitalize on if you're not precise and constantly using um, those equipments or getting larger. And so, you know, for us, it's just one of those things where um, we've continued to grow the operation and maintain what we, what we think is needed. And then from there, we're making the smart decisions on farm marketing, on how we finance the operation, and then where can we use a co-man to come in and help us with some of the harvest side of it where we can't necessarily continue to buy a new combine each and every year or even five years with the depreciation mm -hmm. rates that, that there are today and so um as my brother manages it today those are the decisions we make as my parents continue to age their interest in their in, their investment um, becomes less and less in the operation. So it's really prudent for us to stay sharp and stay on top of those numbers to make it a thriving business. Um, you know, I've listened to Ron Rabo talk a thousand times and, you know, one of the, the best things that I've learned. And I think 
the value of podcasts like this is listening to other people and understanding how maybe they're working through some of this stuff versus the the old adage of this is the way we've done it. This is the way we're always going to do it. And mm -hmm. honestly, we all know in the world of agriculture, management is probably the toughest group to work through, i.e. your dad, your grandfather, your grandmother, or even your sister that lives in New York City, right? Like these are all the realities of the farmers that that we talk to on a daily basis and the problems they're facing today and how they really grow what they call a business or how do they make a profitable lifestyle of farming and ranching. And so with that, I think that's kind of where we're at today. And so as we think about tomorrow, those are the decisions that are facing us. Those are the discussions that my brother and I are forced to have or get to have on what is his, what are his goals? What does he want to do? How many more years does he want to be in the agriculture space, right? Um, you know, just to throw it out there, I mean, my brother, he um, he's a father of five girls. And so, you know, not to, not to, make fun of my brother but he probably deserves five girls <laughs> um and so but as with that right like the opportunity that those girls will actually stay in agriculture becomes very slim and so that's something that my brother and I really have to think about I also have two sons here in Denver Colorado are they interested in going back probably not are they interested in having some ownership in, in the, in the farm? Sure. But what does that look like and what helps everyone stay profitable and not dissolve all the years of a, accumulation that we've put into this thing? Sure. You know, there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that's been shared. So these decisions, as they sound very easy from a business perspective, from a, spreadsheet perspective are all fine and dandy until you add that emotional component of pride greed happiness memories like it just it becomes one of those things where then you start to transition from what looks like a lifestyle to a business to therapy to whatever you want it to be right <laughs> Um, but I'll just kind of pause there and, and well, at, uh, at one point you, um, you must have worked things out with your, with your brother and with your dad that you were going to pursue a career off of the, the farm and ranch, correct? Uh, yeah. You know, I think for me, I always just, you know, I just try and I try and keep it light, but in some ways I've just never grown up. Right. Um, in the fact that. I just haven't gone home yet. I'm still out there learning, growing, trying to understand what I want to do in life. Um, that has led me down many, many, many paths that have not taken me home. But also through that, it's also given me an opportunity to then, like you said, have those discussions with my dad, with my brother, with my mother about what is the actual reality of, of me going back to the farm. And as I've evolved and gotten into um, big agriculture, as you call it, um, I have realized that maybe my strongest attribute back to the family business is being a voice, being a sound of leadership that can say, hey, here is what I'm seeing across the thousands of farmers that I talk to on a, on a yearly basis. Here is what is working. Here is what is not. Here are some of the, the, the loopholes to be cautious of. And then where does that start to really balance us out? You know, and in this in this world, as as you see a lot of that um, 
that downsizing coming in, i.e. the labor force, you know, the increase in technology and those things, where do I best fit in this family operation? And it might be the guy in the office, right? And so for me, you know, I think that that's a valuable understanding of where I might be. But it also took years and years of having that, quote, conversation, if you will, Ron, about what is my role? Because in a traditional farm ranch environment, your role is to return. Your role is to be that physical labor that runs that farm or ranch. In today's world, with everything that's presented to us, I can tell you that I'm a pretty good trader. Mm-hmm. And does the financial trading aspects outweigh any of the labor aspects that I could provide a farm or the insights at which I can develop, deliver technology advice or, or consulting advice, I think that my value per hour is probably better sitting in the environment that I am today, as well as allowing my brother to rise up and be the leader that he is within his space in what I would call now our, our organization versus our farm. You know, I think Mm -hmm. as you take it from farm to business, those are the aspects that you really start to have to delegate and understand from a, from a growth and leadership perspective. And really you're more, you're better when you have the people that are really good at what they're doing, staying focused in those spaces. Mm -hmm. You know, I could make fun of you all day, Ron, for, being a really, really poor cattle guy because you don't like a horse. So, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean you're a bad overall rancher or your ranch will not be profitable because you're there to make the right decisions and you're smart enough to know I can, I've got Logan, I've got these other guys that they will, they love that. They will put their blood, sweat and tears into that day and night because the return on investment for them from an emotional standpoint is there. And so, you know, having my brother, Tom, managing that piece, like that's what he loves. So let's let him do that. Let me take on some of the other responsibility. Let my mom, who's the accountant, tell us if we're right or wrong. And then we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. I'd love to, to pick your brain just a little bit about that, how your family navigated that because we've got a lot of farm families that have, you know, next gens that are on the farmer ranch. And then we've got, you know, the off farm Mm -hmm. kids too. Right. And it sounds like your family has successfully navigated Mm -hmm. allowing you to kind of pursue what you're interested in your passions and kind of bring things back. And I think that that's a really tough thing to negotiate and navigate for families is how do we allow someone who's not here every day have input and bring us things from the outside and not get everybody who's on the farm feeling like, well, you don't know because you're not here. And so you can't possibly understand or you're bringing the big city ideas to the farm. So talk a little bit about how your family navigated that, because I, I can't imagine that it was necessarily always super easy and maybe you've now got a structure for how you do that that if you do I would love to hear what that looks like today you know I think it I think it is it's just it's countless trials and errors probably more errors than not um I think the strongest attribute that has probably brought us to where we are today would be personal failures honestly you know in my life, I've I've been challenged with a number of, I would say, obstacles, some that I've created on my own, whether that was, uh, you know, I quit drinking 10 years ago, right? Something like that. I've gone through a divorce, like real things that I'm happy to share with the world that weren't necessarily the way that they were modeled when I was 
you know, the student body president in a, in a high school class of 25 kids, right? Like you have to go through some of these hardships. And then as you think about those, you think about, okay, now my dad's had a stroke. My brother's moved towns um, due to his girls' sports and wanting to expand their opportunities, right? All of these things that come at us that were not planned, I think if you can take a grain of salt or focus on the little wins in each one of those things, it starts to really make you focus on the little things. And it also helps you focus on what others are going through in their lives and start to bring you together. I would say growing up on the farm, you know, I don't necessarily think I was given all the quote emotional tools that are out there today or that we have access to. Now, some of those I believe in, and some of them I can tell you are complete noise and a distraction of such, but being able to pull um, nuggets of, of inspiration from different hardships or different opportunities really starts to, to help you and put you in a perspective where one, you're not walking in with the ego of this is mine. I should inherit this. I'm, you know, I'm destined for this, right? But more about how do I change for tomorrow? How do I make my brother's life successful? How do I make my my parents' retirement healthy and happy, right? I've got a dad and most farmers, I would say, out here listening to this podcast, you know, dad doesn't have a hobby. Dad's hobby is getting in his truck and driving around that farm and telling you that you need to paint that gate on the on the back 40, 20 miles over. And you're like, do I really have to, who actually would see that little gate? You know, and, but at the end of the day, that's his hobby. And then when you see things like that um, be t- taken away from them, you start to understand, wow, there's a bigger thing in life. And from that bigger thing in life, I try and take it into myself in the fact that how do I, again, how do I make their retirement easy? Well, I mean, to me, the answer, let's hire some high school kids that need a little cash. And guess what? They have time to go paint that gate. When that gate's painted, we're going to send a text message to mom and dad, and we'll see how many days it figure it takes them to find that picture within that text message. But you know what? The day he sees it, he is happy, happy, happy. And then he'll go on to the next thing that he becomes very tunnel visioned on. But you know, as you do those little things, okay, dad becomes happy. That gives Tom a little break, right? He can go and he can he can plant the seed variety that he wants to plant. I can help him, you know, line up some of our, our, our heads to arrive contracts or whatever it is out there in the forward market. And okay, now we understand our inputs. We understand our outputs. We just need to be good farmers at that point. We need to make sure that the pivots are running. And from there, you know, that's how it starts to work little by little. Um, I think each person understanding their role um, is that. I think for me, I guess I'm fortunate that I I don't put any expectation on the returns that I think I should get from the farm, more this is an opportunity of any, anything extra beyond what I do in my own career today is a blessing of itself. And having the farm actually operational and and having that, you know, having it look good across the fence from the neighbor, I mean, that's still a reality. And so you want to just make sure that everything's running as is. And so that's really, I guess I didn't really give you anything concrete, but, you know, communication is that, um, experiences and learning from those, and then just being vulnerable. I think for me, maybe that's where I was trying to get to in all of this is 
I'm, I've had to learn to be super vulnerable, right? Like you grow up on a farm, you grew up with a poker face, right? You don't, mm. you don't show your hardship. You don't know any, you don't know any different. You wake up, you're, you're, you're feeding cattle, you're checking calves before you go to school. You come home from practice, you're driving through to make sure the heifers are, are good. You know, you're up at midnight to do one last cattle check, right? Those are just things that you always did. And you don't take them for granted, but you don't know any different until you come to the quote big city and you start working in, you know, when I'm trading, it's all screens, right? Like people don't understand what we're going through. And so being able to communicate and tell those stories becomes integral in everything we do. I think as you think about diversification or when brothers and sisters move away and they have an ownership in the part of the land, right? Like, of course, like they're listening to a spouse and a spouse may or may not understand what's really going on there. They don't have That's that right. emotional tie to right. really build this thing up. And so I think as, as I see it from my side of the screen, like it just becomes more and more that communication. I think spending time with somebody like Iran, other guys that, that really talk about the, the, the generational gifting and, and challenges of agriculture, I think it's just getting close with that, right? It's feeling it and continuing to tell the story. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, I just think that that's really well said. And I, it, you know, a lot of it boils down to perspective, right? And so you, you mentioned that, that you have had some challenges as, mm -hmm. you know, many of us do in life. It's just part of life and part of the way that it goes, yep. but you've been dealt, dealt some pretty rough cards. And so you and I, um, uh, began to actually, I knew Rena, I knew Sam's cousin before I knew Sam. Um, and so, uh, his cousin is, uh, uh, a friend of mine in, uh, in Cheyenne. And so when, uh, Sam and I started working together on the farm side of things, um, uh, we kind of made that connection and we just had a lot in common and, uh, Sam and I have been able to have the opportunity to do some, some fun things together and some business things together and, uh, lots more of that, you know, in the future. And uh, I've just always appreciated Sam's perspective on everything. Um, just a very thoughtful and very even keel. And that has been um, pretty powerful for me to see that. And so Sam and I, uh, Sam's uh, company that he works for was expanding um, their holdings. And they were looking to purchase a um, um, another company. And um, I happened to be kind of the inner... I don't know the one that that each one of the companies was working with, <laughs> and which was kind of crazy. And so um, each each one of those companies ended up calling me and saying, "What do you think of this other company?" And I just had nothing but like glowing remarks to say for everyone. And so um, when they merged, um, I was privileged enough that they asked me to come in and keynote that. And uh, that really helped kind of boost um, our relationship even further. And it wasn't long after that, um, after that merger, right, Sam, that, that um, uh, the, uh, the owner of the other business um, called me up one night and he said, did you hear about Sam? And I said, no, what's going on? And he said, we don't know if he's going to make it through the night. So um, Sam, I will leave it at that. But Tell us about that day, man. Tell us about a, another just huge, huge change and another another difficult hurdle that that you had to overcome. Oh man, I mean, you just saying that, like having Phil give you a call. I mean, that just turns up the it was, emotions that, it was that very... I don't think about on a daily basis. And so, um, I, I was yeah, in the, I was so in my was... basement with my kids and. um I immediately went into panic mode um, and, uh, you know, called the, yeah, some of the folks so. that you worked with. And um, yeah, it was uh, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable. So let's, uh, yeah, let's, 
let's rip the band-aid off this puppy and go but um <laughs> so it was january 28th uh 2022 uh, it was a friday morning beautiful um colorado sunshiny snowy day um it was a friday morning i you know it was nice it was during the covid time so it was quote work from home well i just chose to work out of the goose blind that morning and uh and so I was, you know, doing my normal thing, just taking a few conference calls. Uh, I talked to a large grocery store chain that morning about um, their organic bread flour and and some of their artisan type loaves that I was I was buying their organic wheat for, and and what we were, what were some of the characteristics at which we could provide on a flour side, and and this, that, and the other. And I know that's a little off topic but i quick i'd hung up that phone call and you know and then i was on to my next meeting which involved you know this large flock of geese that were flying overhead and and coming down into our into our set of decoys and uh you know as those as the geese worked down it was a it was a successful it was a successful shoot and one that you know i hadn't even you know at this time of the year, I just was enjoying just being out there. And so, you know, I think I shot once and, and called it good. And, and as, as we hunted that day, um, I had a number of guys with me and generally, um, I have my dog in a, in a, in a little, like in her own little kennel way off on the edge. But with all the guys that were hunting with us that day, I had Lulu, my little black lab sitting in the in the hunting blind with me and and as we as we got out and the birds were laying around I saw one drift way off into the distance and and generally and so then I was going to send Lulu out on a retrieve and so I got out of my my little layout blind and I was standing in front of front of the blind and I tapped my leg and to get Lulu's attention and I gave her the point and the minute I gave her that point my life changed. Uh, she charged out of the blind, um, stepping on my stepping on my gun, which discharged, and um, my right ankle was sitting about two feet in front of that gun barrel. Um, needless to say, I had no idea what had just happened. I found myself laying on the ground, um, and people yelling and screaming and. And Lulu laying on top of me, wondering, you know, thinking she was in trouble, but there I laid. And I didn't know what was going on until I saw my leg and, you know, it was sitting a direction that my, the rest of my, my foot was laying a direction that the rest of my body was not. And so I knew I was in pretty bad trouble um, to the point where you're just like, holy, and then bleep, 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 um, and you know, so the guys quickly were shuffling around, phone calls were being made. Um, luckily, one of the guys, you know, somebody put a belt on my leg, then one of the gentlemen ended up having a tourniquet. And so they put this tourniquet on my leg, as 911 was called. Um, through all that, um, the realities were slowly setting in on what was going on. Uh, they had to get a pickup out in the middle of the, the field. Um, and, and load me up in the back of a pickup. They ended up getting me to the side of the field where the ambulance had shown up. And, you know, the injury was was that, that I didn't have a foot left, right? Like it was, it was one of my, luckily one of my buddies, you know, politely put it in the pickup for me, right? Like it was that bad. And so as we started to work that avenue, I got into the ambulance, they, um, it was 30 minutes to Greeley, Colorado, or it was about 45 minutes to Denver, Colorado that day through the ambulance. They chose to go to Greeley um, just due to traffic concerns that they might in experience into Denver. Um, we rushed to Greeley. Um, I still remember the opportunity to, to sit there and hold the ER guys, Mike's belt loop. And he's just like, just keep talking to me, man. And, you know, you got, you got needles going in you, you got, every, you know, people yelling and screaming, but 
you know, it's just like, oh my gosh, like this was the first time in my life and all the dumb things that I've experienced or done in my life that I knew I couldn't, I wasn't just going to be able to rub a little dirt on this thing. Like there was something going on that I was out of control with and it wasn't like I was and you, my body at that moment and my mind, my whole thing, I was like, I have to surrender to this. And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't even think about it in the sense of that. But as they rushed me to the hospital, they got me to Greeley. I recall waking up and introducing myself to all the ER docs. I mean, it's just who Sam is like, hey, let's be upbeat and happy. And Oh, by the way, he probably doesn't <laughs> have all his body here with him anymore. But, you know, and then they worked on me. They worked on me that night for about eight hours. Um, they did blood infusions. Uh, I think they put uh, 11 units of blood in me. Um, from what I'm told, your body holds about 12 to 13 on the maximum side. So, you know, I was pretty well flushed out. Um, no recollection of that after that after that day, um, that evening, after they tried to work on my leg for a long time, um, they, they tried a number of things. They, they took all the veins out of my other leg and tried to, throw, you know, loop them into my foot to save the foot. I mean, it just was one, one trial after another that nothing worked. They put me in a coma. The next day was when, when life started to change, right? Um, they woke me up about, I would say noonish, noonish to one-ish. Um, and, um, and, uh, and they, there they were, there was all these doctors standing in this room and, you know, just like the movies when things are unclear and it's a blur and voices are muffled, right? That's when, you know, and there's my brother sitting there and my cousin and my ex-wife and, you know, it's just like the the people that I wanted to be in the room were there, you know, for that day at that time, right. That knew me. And so at that point, the doctor, which was, um, this Dr. Noche, um, he started to give me my options. He's like, Hey, what's going on? And we started talking and, and to the point where, okay, you've got two options, Sam, we can either, um, try and perform surgery here that will, allow you to grow a cadaver bone, reconstruct your foot. It's probably going to be, you know, a couple years, if not 15 surgeries, probably to re to restructure everything. And at the end of the day, you're probably going to have a foot, but it's not going to be functional. Or option two would be let's amputate and you'll be walking in two months. I mean, I looked at the guy and I was like, well, what would you do? He's like, I'd amputate. I'm like, well, then cut it off. And then he proceeded to to let to smile. He's like, but he had to ask me about ten more times and to make sure that everyone heard it. It was recorded. It was documented. Then they hand you the the book and you just start signing away. And I mean, I I would love to see how how uh, unclear my signature was on those. But at the end of the day. That was the decision made. Um, and so then the, it was, we decided and it was going to be the next day I'd be amputated. Like I had no idea what was going on, but that night I think was probably one of the most um, moving moments of my life as I wasn't able to be put back in a coma, but yet I had to, to lay with this pain. I had to lay in this room of darkness with nothing but a nurse by my side and a clock in front of me and a bot and a button for morphine right and as i sat there i would watch that clock tick every two minutes and i could nail it by either looking at the clock or just counting because i was so at in focus with what was going on i knew the pain i couldn't have any drinks i couldn't have any food um but so, but I, through that night, I remember just seeing visions of, you know, watching my life, watching my life just move past me to a point where 
I was going to change. Like this was an opportunity for me to start to rebuild my life. And that next morning we had the surgery and it continued that dream and those visions to a point where I call it, I call it the white rhino. And it truly was. It was this experience where if you've ever sat in yoga or if you ever meditated or what have you, when they say, okay, you're in a room, you have your feet grounded, you're looking ahead and you see the light to give you that focus. And as I did that, just in that state of pain and what have you, all of a sudden in that light came this rhino. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And I remember just like, you know how you squint and you're trying to figure out something in the distance, but it just kept coming closer and it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger until I identified that it truly was a, was a rhino. And as it came to me, it went right over my shoulder. And at that moment, that clearness and that consciousness of what my life was going to be was what I then woke up to. I sat in the hospital room. I had, you know, a hundred different IVs in my arms. I had, uh, you know, respirators. I had these big machines on my legs flushing them out so the infections would move on. Um, it just was one of those opportunities where I knew my life had changed. Um, it was so surreal. And that was where I later call it the creation of Sammy Bev 2.0. I think everyone has always yep. called me Sammy Bev through the years, but as they've done that, um, it just became you know, this is my time. This is my time of change. This is my time to be something different, to be something that I didn't think was possible. I was scared shitless to say the word, right? Like I didn't know what was going to happen, but I knew something was going to be different. Everything else that I was dealing with in life, whether it was the trade positions that I had on, the the financial commitments to my kids' hockey, to um, all the things that were happening in my life, nothing mattered except I knew I was good. I knew that I had to rebuild myself and I knew that I had to be an example for my boys. And the only way I knew that was leaning back into my farm, being a kid of a farm, right? Like you show no emotion you show you just get up and you do right you you rub the dirt on it but you know all those things that are you know being tough like you don't know any difference so that's what I started doing right and I remember them giving me my phone and you know it had probably 800 text messages and a thousand phone calls on it I was on so many drugs I couldn't read the phone and so I just start like I'd look, I'd just start hitting the text message. I'd put it on speakerphone. I'd lay it on my chest and whoever answered, that's who I talked to for the next hour. And I literally did that for 48 hours straight. I mean, I did sleep in there and I did eat. But as I went through that, those stories, those people that reached out, it created this world where you have people behind you you go back to those things of communication. You go back to those things of what are the important things in life that really get you through the day of the day that you forget, right? And as we talked earlier about the stress of farming and the stress of work and the stress of all these things, I had this moment where it was so clear. And so Sammy Bev 2.0 kind of to take off I knew that I had to be that inspiration. I knew that my boys needed me. You know, Jack will be a senior this year in high school and Gage will be a sophomore in high school this year. They need me, right? They need to learn. They need to see by example. And the only way I know how to do that is to keep doing it. Um, and through those, the next few months, the next couple of years that I've now gone through, 
Um, it's interesting to look back on all the things and all the trials and tribulations that I went through. So as I, as I was in the hospital, I walked on my third day. So they gave me a walker and they said, if you can walk and you can take a shower, we'll let you out of this hospital. Well, that took me, I was in the hospital, I was in, that took me four days, right? Like I walked in one day, the next day they gave me a shower and then on Friday they let me out. So end to end from shooting my leg off to getting out of the hospital was exactly one week. Um, it was during COVID. There was no beds at any hospitals. There was no beds at any um, of the rehabilitation clinics like the Craig Institute and things like that. So I was left to go home. You know, wow. I was supposed to have in-home care, but there was no, there wasn't any nurses available. There wasn't any physical therapists available because of COVID. And so I had to create this network of people. And luckily through all those people, one of my really good friends, Molly Jones, was working for the Hanger Clinic, which was a prosthetics company. He and her, her ex-husband had owned a prosthetics company. And luckily, I mean, just the way that the Lord sets things up or, or whatever your faith is, sets things up. Like all of a sudden, Molly Jones calls me and she's like, this can't be the Sam Beverage I know. I said, it sure is. So what's up? And she's like, <laughs> you know, and so just by that and by knowing people, you know, she, you know, I found a prosthesis to build my legs. I found a physical therapist to help me with, with my mobility, um, different organizations in the, in town that knew about prosthetic type things that I could talk to, you know, my world just started to happen. People, all my friends were rallying behind me, right? And that's where it started to create and grow. Um, I ended up walking within mm, two months. Um, I biked probably, I rode my bike after about three months. And through all that, I just was in constant pain. Um, as they found out, I had still had osteomyotitis or basically a really bad staph infection inside my leg, which at six months we had to completely redo the surgery. I had to get amputated again. I took off another half an inch of bone to remove all that um, infection. And I had to start over again. Um, you know, that was a real challenging point as I'd already sat on a couch for eight weeks and they're telling me, well, you gotta sit on a couch another eight weeks. Um, but, you know, through all that, like, you know, people tell me I was happy. People tell me that I'm inspirational. Yeah, I guess so. But you're also sitting in by yourself a lot, right? You have to really look inside yourself and find who it is you want to be and who you want to show the world. And I think trying to get those two things to marry up would probably be where I see my, my childhood coming out, right? Because there's a fight there. There's a fight between what the world thinks you should be and are versus what you're feeling inside. And that marriage of those two from a refactory to to that side of it, I think that's where the stress comes. And that's where the misalignment comes. And, you know, as Ron, you talked about earlier, these people that make choices that aren't always the best. And when they're put in these stressful situations, that's where you really, you gotta, you gotta really dig deep. And I think just having the ability to find those tools and to find people to support you and to know that people support you is huge. I mean, I don't know how many times, I mean, luckily I know Ron super well and I'm probably making this a little too minute, too intimate, but I've cried on Ron, Ron Rabo's shoulder more times than I care to admit being a tough guy, but I have to do it because there's a lot of days that are dark, but there's also so many days that are so bright. And as I've continued to build through these days, 
you know, it's like golf. You have one good swing out of 18 holes. You think you're, you love the game of golf. Well, it's the same mm. thing, right? And so as I've moved through the last two and a half years, I've gone from being able to ride a bike around the block to riding, you know, 50 miles to a hundred miles. And now this year, my leg finally works the way I think it should work. I can put abuse to it. I've been training nonstop. I have a goal of mine, and that is to race the Leadville 100 mountain bike race, which is 104 miles. It's a 11 and a half thousand feet of elevation gain in one day for climbing. And most of that is over um, 10,000 feet of elevation. I've done it 12 times with two legs, but this year my goal and my aspiration for myself and for those out there that I'm trying to help inspire, whether that's one person or 50, I don't care, um, is to do it half horsepower, right? I want to do it one leg, you know, granted I've got a, a pirate leg and a regular leg, but I'm calling this 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 movement half horsepower. Um, and so Sammy Bev 2.0 is what that's going to be. Um, and as I've done that this summer, as I've built started building towards that, one of my new goals came up. One of my longtime goals has popped up as an opportunity, and that was last week. Um, last week I participated in the US Para para nationals road race so para olympics and usa cycling put together a um, road race competition for para athletes um i i always wanted to win that thing so i packed my bike up i found my way to janesville wisconsin and uh i brought home the gold medal and uh, nice I'm super absolutely excited. incredible. That's it, really it, great. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. But it was just it it meant so much to me to to come from where I was on that couch or apps laying in that field thinking my life was over to mm -hmm. where I am today and what I still want to accomplish. Um, you know. But finally getting that medal meant so much to me um, outside of work, outside of anything else, right? Mm. But it's it goes back to those little things of marrying what the world thinks you should be to what you feel you need to be. Mm -hmm. And I would say I always put a lot of pressure on myself to be out there sooner but my body wouldn't let me. So was I, was I meeting expectations? Was I, was I exceeding expectations for the world or was I okay with where I was at? I have to play that game in my head. And as I've done that, I've become more and more comfortable. And you know what? Everyone's path is different. Everyone deals with different things, but for me to to come where I have and now to sit back and look at that goal accomplished, it just allows me to sit, to to look at people and say, you know, you don't know what everyone's dealing with. And so um, now I've got more goals, right? I still have my Leadville goal that I need to accomplish. You know, I'm still waking up at 5 a.m. every day and riding my bike when no one else is out there. I'm having those conversations with myself just like a farmer, just like a rancher, when I'm checking cows, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm running pipe, right? Like it's the same game. Like nobody's acknowledging the, the little details that allow you to be the bigger person that you are and to um, inspire those around you, like your kids or like your friends or anyone. And so I think that's where for me, that's been a super monumental um, piece of my story to this point. Um, and I'll just kind of pause there and, and uh, see what kind of questions you guys might have. Sam, I, um, I'm just, I get chills every time I hear the story, man. 
because I re- I remember um, before you had to have your second amputation. I remember talking to you when you were laying on your couch. Yeah, and you were pretty upset. And sometimes you just need to know that there's other people out there in the world that are willing to lift you up and that are willing to encourage you. And um, and it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, you don't have to be the guy that you know is going through what you had to go through, but maybe it's just something where, you know, you're really down in the dumps and you just feel like just throwing in the towel and you just want to give up. But I think your message is, you know, you can have those bad days and you can want to give up. The only way that you actually fail is if you actually give up. Yeah. And, and that's one thing that I've always taken away from you is that no matter how hard it's been for you, you've just continued to move forward. And, 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 um, through all of our conversations, um, it was always so interesting, interesting to, me. to me. I wrote a, a newspaper column um, about Sam. I don't even know what was that a year ago or something. Most but it. anyway, it was really about, I was so inspired by you in the fact that you pushed through a lot of this stuff in large part because you're an Aggie, right? I like, agree. Like you learned this stuff when you grew up on the farm. And, and you just don't have a quitting bone in your body. And right. even though those days got tough, and even though those days were more than you thought that you could ever get past, you were just like, man, I'm just, I'm just doing what I need to do because the dadgum cows need to be fed. So we're going to feed them, right? Yeah, like too, Sam right? needs to get better. So that's what I'm going to do. Sam's going to get better. And, okay. and some days the, uh, um, some days it gets pretty rough, but mm-hmm. the only way that that cow herd can get better is if you continue to feed him. And the only way we can make ourselves better is if we continue to push forward in everything that we do in every aspect of our life. Change. You've been listening to the Ag Inspo podcast with Ron Rabo and Rena Striegel. Find Ag Inspo on Farm Journal's YouTube channel, and anywhere you find your favorite podcasts. For more information about today's guest or the resources referenced, please see the show notes below. Join us for part two as we continue this conversation with Sam Beveridge.